Hello, Optive Source Zero Con. My name is Rami Rahman. I'm a cloud architect with Optive. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Super pumped to give this talk, coming at you live from Santa Ana, California. And a little bit about me. I'm a 12-year veteran here at Optive. I started in 2009 in our Security Operations Center. And I've also been a solutions architect here in Southern California. And I most recently took a position that focused specifically on cloud native security platforms. And I started to see a lot of commonalities in our Optive clients. So I wanted to do this talk today around how to have our cloud incident response and forensics capabilities evolve. And so that is what the talk track is today, the evolution of cloud forensics and incident response. And so I wrote a blog post around this. I will give you that information later after this talk. Uh, I will also be available in the Discord channel and jumping into the voice chat. So I would invite you to come join me afterwards if you have any questions and talk about uh, what I'm presenting today. So thank you very much for joining. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with a couple of statistics that I've collected over the past year or so in doing the evaluation of many of our cloud environments for our clients, or more specifically, multi-cloud environments, because most of our clients have presence in AWS, Azure, or GCP. And across about 12 different multi-cloud environments, I noted that there were these commonalities of these specific misconfigurations. So the first one is VPC flow logs being turned off. There were, I had to actually update this earlier this week, I noted 1,401, but another client, I was able to assess their environment and now we're up to 1,551 VPC flow logs or NSG flow logs where the logs are not turned on, right? And essentially this is the equivalent of putting a router or a switch or a firewall in the data center and flying blind. If you had an investigation that you had to do, you'd never be able to get that log data from those flow logs because that log data is turned off. And so this is obviously alarming for people that are security personnel and it creates a visibility gap, but it also requires you to have a financial conversation with the cloud account owners that own this infrastructure, mainly because just like everything else in the cloud, there is an additional cost in generating it. So a specific scenario, I had one particular security director have to tell me and say, we have to wait for finance to approve this. And the cloud teams are going to project the cloud cost for a week. And then they'll come back and turn the cloud logs once they've gotten financial approval. All the while, all that log activity that was happening in those 1,551 VPCs or NSGs was not going to any central location or being generated at all. So if there was a security incident happening during that lag time, they would never be able to see it. And maybe not all of these NSGs or uh, VPCs are production traffic, but at the very least, you should turn the flow, log flow logs in for your critical infrastructure or your production infrastructure. Otherwise, you'd be falling, flying blind like Sandra Bullock over here. Okay, so the next misconfiguration that I wanted to note about um, was equally alarming and equally kind of crazy. There were 133 users that did not have multi-factor authentication with their IAM role, right? Or IAM account. And so obviously this is a uh, reduction in your you know, security posture. And if any of those credentials were to be compromised, those users that didn't have MFA enabled, if you had the account number, which is usually bookmarked, right? Of any AWS account or Azure account, you could potentially leverage those non protected by two-factor authentication IAM rules, uh, users, and uh, that'd be crazy, right? <laughs> Just like Will Ferrell getting hit in the neck with a trank. All right, so this next one uh, is equally alarming, and it is in regards to the root account. The root account is the master account that creates those IAM users, and 27 of those root accounts did not have MFA enabled, right? And so that means we could do whatever we want. We have the root account. We can actually join a new, uh, 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 we can acquire uh, the rights and assume the roles of all those other users. And we can maybe join someone to an AWS organization that didn't want to be and, 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 uh, and, and put some service control policies, right? Obviously, you want to make sure that your uh, privileged credentials are <laughs> protected by two-factor authentication in every way possible. Otherwise, you're going to be like this kid and get smacked in the face. All right, <laughs> so moving on, 
<laughs> so, uh, and this next one is in relation to a pretty uh, well-known and documented vulnerability with regards to the instance metadata service version one. And so uh, for the uninitiated, if you're not unfamiliar with this particular service within AWS, this is AWS specific, this instance metadata service was leveraged in a now infamous hack where a server side request forgery attack was performed and many, many PII uh, customer data and um, a lot of information was leaked uh, from an S3 bucket because of this. And I found over 50,000 EC2 instances with this disabled, and Dwight's not a fan of that. And so this, this particular instance metadata service vulnerability was referenced in uh, one of the earlier talks this week, uh, which was Cloud Pen Testing 101. I was really glad to see that someone uh, pointed this out, but I noted in the client environments that I worked in, uh, quite a large amount of EC2 instances had this disabled. And you know, there, AWS put a blog post about this particular vulnerability quite a while ago and said, hey, if you're not gonna use the EC2 uh, metadata service version two, which requires authentication via a token to be able to uh, leverage any of the services that it's attached to, at the very least put a WAF or a firewall or have some other compensating control. And so most people don't even know uh, that there the, are the, the, that many EC2 instances in their environment that are susceptible to this, but I was able to identify this in very quick manner by using a cloud security posture management tool that was able to parse through the configuration. And looking at those configurations is gonna be kind of a major portion of our talk today and understanding the implications of monitoring those configurations, the attack surface, and all the things that could potentially go wrong with these misconfigurations. So those are just kind of some of the statistics that I wanted to outline to open us up today uh, to kind of paint the picture that there is a lot of work to do. These cloud accounts have probably been around for a long time and they have gone, you know, flying under the radar, haven't been tracking, you haven't been tracking the configuration for a very long time. So there is a lot of room for configuration drift or misconfiguration for that matter. And so uh, definitely understand the implications of that specifically with the instance metadata service version two. All right, Dwight. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into a mock attack scenario that I outlined in the Evolution of Cloud Forensics and Incident Response blog. And um, we're gonna go do this live, so hopefully everything works out okay. And so what I wanted to outline is that two factor, or two factors with, or I am users with that two factor authentication will essentially be the foothold that I'll have for this particular attack, right? So my foothold, my only foothold into this attack scenario is compromised AWS credentials without 2FA, much like those 133 IAM users had. It doesn't even have to be the root user, right? And so what I wanted to outline is that AWS really doesn't do a lot of behavioral analysis on your login. So I'm gonna go ahead and log into the Ukraine with my new Nord VPN. Hopefully our connection is gonna be quick in the Ukraine. And I've obfuscated part of my screen here to log in so I could hide my account ID, but I'm gonna log in with this account ID that doesn't have two-factor authentication enabled. And as you can see, all right. And we're about it, ready to rock and roll. And so now I'm an attacker. I've gotten access to the EC2 console. And as I log into the EC2 console, I can see that there was an instance running. This instance name is Sub-Zero. We got a little Mortal Kombat theme going on today. And all I have to do to be able to access this instance is to assign a role. This instance role that I'm going to assign is part of what they call the Amazon System Session Manager or System Manager. So I'm gonna right click on this instance. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to the security screen. I'm going to modify the IAM role. So I'm going to take this off the screen for a second so I can obfuscate my account ID and then I'll bring it back. So here we go. So now I'm assigning a role and this role is the Amazon SSM role for quick instance setup. And one of the things I'm going to note later on is that IAM is incredibly, incredibly complex. There are several roles and all of those roles have different types of policies and that blast radius can be pretty substantial. So I'm gonna save this role. And so now I'm gonna be able to connect to this device 
There you go. I'm going to be able to connect to this device without having to have SSH access through the system session manager. So I'm going to connect. And here we go. We're in. OK, so what is the system session manager? So this is an agent that's deployed much like uh, SCCM or any other you know, system manager agent. And it has valid use cases. You could do a lot of things with this. For example, if you forget the admin password or if you lose SSH keys, you can go back in and generate them. But obviously, it can be weaponized like I'm doing here. And so when you get dropped into this screen, you're essentially, uh, let's see, who am I? You're dropped in as SSM user, right? And SSM user is running as root. So now, I could sudo to root. And who am I now? I'm the root user, right? I'll go ahead and make this a little bit larger so people can see a little bit better. So give me one second here. So yeah. Yeah. So as you can see, this wasn't very crafty or sophisticated, and most of the hacks that are out there really aren't, right? They're just uh, taking advantage of improper IT hygiene or uh, maybe not having compensating controls. Uh, this can be disabled. You can actually set it up to where this is either not installed or uh, you ha can uh, also log the commands that are happening in the system, system session manager, but you have to configure that. And that's kind of the the the, the the reoccurring theme is that in order for you to be able to get the native logs configured, you have to set up things like an S3 bucket. Well, I didn't do that, and neither did the administrator that owns this. So the, the session commands that I'm running within the system, system session manager are not being logged to an S3 bucket or CloudWatch logs because we didn't set that up, right? Now, they will be logged locally within the operating system itself, but that doesn't really scale if you're a security persona. You're not going to jump into every single EC2 instance out there and look at the logs directly on the host, right? So the point that I wanted to make with this is that once you're here, I can do whatever I want, right? So I could actually start, let's say, right? I can start generating my own SSH keys, right? It's actually SSH dash key gen. Source zero up him. And there I am. Actually, I already did this, but yes, I'm going to create my own SSH keys. And once I have my own SSH keys, now I can SSH this. Now I don't need this Amazon System Session Manager. Okay, so I'll move that off the screen here pretty briefly, and then we'll go to SSH and we'll start doing some commands from there. All right, so here I am. I'm logged in. And obviously, um, I've made myself a, you, you can make yourself a, a new user as well, right? Um, I could do that also through the session manager. Um, but uh, I've done that already for us. And I've done that on this host called Subzero. And so sub, on this host called Subzero, I want to be able to sudo add users. Scorpion. There we go. Give Scorpion a password. All right, don't need to put his info. He's a Mortal Kombat character after all. And then I can also add S Scorpion to the pseudo -others group from here as well. So, mod a G Scorpion. Mod, branch A, corporate B, Scorpion, right? And so I, obviously adding him to the pseudos group gives that um, give him gives him the ability to um, essentially run his root, right? So now I can ask you to Scorpion. Anyway, 
So, um, yeah. So obviously you have, um, you know, some, some things that you want to be able to chase down in your environment so you could replicate this. Um, but yeah. So, um, okay. So what did we learn? What are some lessons learned? Let's go ahead and jump back into our slides here. Obviously, our foothold was just those compromised credentials without 2 effect, right? And some lessons learned. Uh, I am in the cloud can be incredibly complex. Try to use cloud infrastructure entitlement management, right? And so, obviously, this is something that is an entirely different space. And that entirely different space is um, obviously geared towards making sure that I am in the cloud is metered down. There's this concept of net effective permissions. And net effective permissions essentially calculates what every single IAM role has access to in terms of uh, their blast radius, right? And so um, there are point solutions that do this, uh, but this also could be part of the cloud security posture management tool, right? And there are the, the, the best solutions that do this have this concept of a just enough privileges controller, right? And this just enough privileges controller allows you to meter down just the amount of privileges that you need to have uh, the IAM user be able to do their job, and they can even broker those types of uh, granting that type of access. So understand that as we move to the cloud, we inherited an entirely new set of IAM privileges, and we should be treating those as if we did our on-premise ones, right? We should be doing things like enabling two-factor authentication and potentially using SSO for our AWS accounts or Azure accounts or any of those cloud accounts so that you have a way to centrally manage access to them. Another lesson learned is configurations, flow logs, and admin activity should be tracked. Try to use a cloud security posture management tool where possible, right? So obviously this is a, um, uh, an entirely different space in and of itself, but uh, the cloud security posture management um, space has a lot of players, but only a few of these players can do all of these things very well. And the things that these do can be mapped back to traditional on-premise security operations workflows to make sure that you have an alerting mechanism. Um, you know, if, if you're logging in from the Ukraine with your AWS account that's not protected with uh, two-factor authentication, that you can track user activity and say that that's potentially an account hijacking attempt, right? So understand the use cases for cloud security posture management and understand what they should be analyzing. I'll give you an anecdote, some anecdotal stories. The analysis of flow logs is actually really important because in one client environment, I was able to identify one particular uh, sandbox environment that was talking to suspicious IP addresses, right? A, a good cloud security posture management tool should be able to analyze the flow log data and be able to tell you that your cloud's talking to suspicious IP addresses and you should be able to uh, alert on that. And in this particular client environment, there was a sandbox that was left running and that sandbox had SSH opened to the wide world. And we were able to find out that it had suspicious IP addresses talking to it. And also because we were able to track admin activity on who made this particular cloud environment that was left running, we were able to track down the admin that owned it. And he said, hey, thanks. That was, I forgot I left that up and running. That's been generating a $20,000 a month bill in my AWS bill. I didn't even know about that. And so there can be some great stories where you call back some money for the corporation just by doing analysis of what those flow logs um, are doing, as well as uh, essentially looking at your cloud and uh, looking at all the configurations that are running and trying to determine what's you know valid or what is been left behind. There's a lot of cleanup to do, and a cloud security posture management can do uh, tool can do that in a matter of minutes. Uh, the next. Um, lesson that we learn is that you should consider selecting a cloud workload protection platform or an EDR in your cloud, but there are use cases for each one and which one would you pick and why, right? So cloud workload protection platforms versus incident uh, endpoint detection and response agents, uh, that's a conversation that you should have to see if you're deploying something on that host, like that EC2 host that we were uh, on, something on that host that is able to determine what type of processes are doing what, right? So there are use cases for each one. Um, 
that have advantages for one or the other. So I'll give a couple of use case examples here. I'll go back into my cloud workload protection platform that I have logged in here. So that is that right there. And so um, there are two, one, two of them that I'm going to demonstrate today, right? Uh, one of them is the Cortex XDR agent. And in the mock attack scenario that I outlined, if I'm still at that command line, if I still have the ability to um, you know, log into that device, uh, I could potentially delete those other users and lock the administrator out of the device. But um, if I have this agent deployed, I can actually initiate a live terminal and do some EDR type of activities, which is what I'm doing right now. So I'm connecting back into that sub-zero endpoint and this will allow me to actually run commands on that post locally, right? So that's an advantage that endpoint detection and response tools have specific to that use case for um, you know, protecting your cloud or getting visibility into the cloud. So I can come here, I can come to this command line, command line. I can then sudo add user for zero. And there I am. I'm able to add back in a user. If that other user that compromised my host started deleting the other admins, I can add myself back in as an admin. So that's an advantage that an endpoint detection or response tool has. But the cloud workload protection platform will have a little bit more cloud native protection and will have coverage for things like containers. It will also have advantages such as um, deploying a WAF, right? And so uh, all those commands that I ran could essentially be tracked with the cloud workload protection platform. And if I needed to do any kind of WAF activity or WAF um, uh, protection on that, that's something that the cloud workload protection has and is a, as an advantage over the, um, the um, EDR tools, right? So if I go and look at things that were generated by that source zero post, right? Sub zero, not source zero. Sorry about that, folks. All right, I balance. There we go. All right, and so now I can see all the commands that were run and the sensitive modifiers, uh, sensitive files that were modified on this. Um, I could see myself adding Scorpion as user over SSH. I could see all the things that were, um, you know, uh, generated on the host as, uh, with regards to sensitive files. I could see. Um, commands that were run by sudo, which user was running those commands, what time. Um, obviously, some of this can be done with an EDR, but um, you know the uh, the advantage that the cloud workload protection platform gives you is that um, it's specific to that use case for protecting things that are supposed to be publicly exposed with a WAF. And not only does it have the ability to protect it with a WAF, but it also has a vulnerability scanner that's built into it. So the same thing that's going to be able to tell you what is um, you know, or protect your or your workloads at, with runtime protection and at the file system, outgoing network, and um, process level will also be able to protect your publicly exposed ports from the OWASP top 10. That's an advantage that the um, cloud workload protection platforms have over EDR. Um, and so I could see essentially every single command that was run uh, earlier when I was um, doing this. And uh, in addition to that, too, I can see on this actual host, which is the sub-zero host, I can see all the vulnerabilities that are on that sub-zero host. And so now the same thing that's giving me vulnerability data is going to be able to give me information on or give me a, a mechanism to be able to block um, OWASP top 10s with publicly exposed ports with a WAF. And it's very easy to deploy. It doesn't take network changes. It doesn't require uh, a lot of lift. You could, in a couple of clicks, have a zero-day zero critical vulnerability that's protected by the WAF or runtime protection uh, with the Cloud Workload Protection Platform. So that's one advantage that a Cloud Workload Protection Platform has over um, an EDR, right? So, But like I said, there are use cases for both, and there's nothing wrong with deploying both for specific use cases. 
Um, just understand the implications of that. There may be some whitelisting that you'll have to do for the EDR to be able to allow the workload protection platform processes to run. But ultimately, uh, they have a there, there's a there's a place for both of them, right? So, um, okay. Okay, so what is our call to action? Uh, essentially, it's a back to basics approach. Make sure that you're doing some basic things like ensure the logging is enabled. Don't be those 1,551 other VPC flow log owners that don't have logs enabled and are flying blind. At the very least, enable things like cloud trail, but the VPC flow logs are really important in addition to operating system logs and, um, and uh, application logs from the cloud host um, understand also that there are certain types of native tools that require additional logging to be set up or say a bucket to be set up to send those logs to. Um, you could try to do this with a SIM, but that would be very costly and you would be traversing the public cloud to the public internet and there's a cost there. Doing them native, natively within, in, within the cloud will be able, will allow you to do it at scale and be as fast and as nimble as your cloud teams are standing up this infrastructure that is wildly leaving your control. So ensure the logs are turned on. And uh, like I said before, make sure that you collect and aggregate those logs essentially for correlation and analysis, specifically things like CloudWatch or send those logs to a third party like a Splunk or even a Devo, which is a newer platform that can scale with automation um, but uh, a Prism Cloud or any CSPM tool will actually capture a lot of this log data for you as well and be able to put it in a centralized location and you can create alerting mechanisms from the CSPM tool that also has the Cloud Workload Protection Platform capabilities built in as well. And so um, another call to action would be to rewrite incident response playbooks to support cloud native services, right? So obviously this is something that um, you know we didn't do in the past and these incident response, the incident response playbooks that we wrote in the past were geared towards on-premise workflows. So now we should rewrite those for cloud. Um, a couple of additional considerations here that I would recommend would be to use things like AWS or GCP organizations this is a hierarchy model of being able to take in a master account that manages those many sub accounts. And that organizational unit can push these things called service control policies that can prevent a lot of the misconfigurations that can happen, that can disable things like regions, that can make sure that you know, people are um, putting up guardrails before the, um, the, uh, the cloud owners or, or whomever is gonna be using that cloud account uh, are gonna do something that is gonna put the uh, organization at risk. Um, one of the other things that I note in the blog post that I made around this is to align yourself with the MITRE framework for enterprise cloud, right? And that MITRE framework has many different stages of the MITRE attack matrix that are and, and links to show you what are you can get in. Obviously, in this scenario, I used um, valid accounts, right, and, and, and valid services. Um, but aligning to the MITRE framework will help increase your security posture. Um, and then, of course, like we said before, deploy an EDR or to any cloud host and a cloud workload protection platform solution that can monitor more granularly at the host level and understand the advantages of both of those, right? So um, this is a picture of the attacks, um, the, uh, the minor attack matrix for enterprise cloud um, that is in the blog post that I'll leave um, in the chat here pretty shortly. Um, and it show you can see each of the stages of the minor talk matrix, but um, this has been referenced before in that cloud pen testing 101 talk. Um, and then this is kind of the synopsis of, of that blog post, right? So, um, okay, well, that is all I had for today. I really hope you enjoyed this talk. And if anyone has any kind of um, follow-ups, I'll be in the Discord channel here pretty shortly. And uh, thank you very much for watching.